Continuing with the Declaration of Independence, after looking at some commonly held beliefs that are actually incorrect technically about the Declaration of Independence, we want to look at now the Declaration of, uh, of Separation. Okay. Now, the, the Declaration of, we talked about is a, it's not a legally binding document. It wasn't even technically a legally binding document when it was signed. There were more than one Declaration of Independence. It's the one that's notorious. It's the one that became famous, and rightly so, because it, it embodied the statement of all the 13 colonies and the 13 states at this time. But we want to look at why was it written? Why was the Declaration of Independence written? And it's not just the Declaration of Independence, but a Declaration of Separation from a government. And we look at some points here, and Jefferson writes, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now, what he's saying there is that out of a reasonable respect for the opinions of others who will be seeing America and Britain split and therefore go to war out of seeing wondering what the Americans could be thinking what is their rationale for taking on one of the most or the most powerful military empire on earth during this time period that these unruly colonies over a couple cent tax, it seems, are, and some government intrusion in a few areas, it seems that this is an overreaction. And so Jefferson says, out of a decent respect of, of a general caring about what people think, we now explain ourselves. What caused this separation? What caused this political divorce, according to the Americans, in the words of Jefferson. What caused this to take place? What were the causes that impelled them to the separation? Jefferson writes. Now, it's clear that the declaration was not notifying King George or the British government, British Parliament. This declaration would not be accepted as legal. The British government would not accept their claims of constitutionality, of British common law, all these things, would not accept their rights as they are defined in the Declaration of Independence as legitimate. And they knew this. So it was, was not for Britain. It may have been for the British people. A lot of them were on the sides of the Americans or were against going to war with the Americans because they were fellow British, fellow Christians, uh, their, their own people. So they were very much against going to war in many cases and paying taxes in order to keep colonies a part of an empire that they no longer wish to exist with and so it was not so much for the British government to realize what was taking place. It would become clear in other cases, but or didn't mean that the British government would say, oh, well, as long as we've been notified, this is acceptable to us. Right. Some people believe that, well, in order to do an action like this, you would have to ask the government's permission. But they're not asking permission. They're declaring a right of separation. There's a huge difference there. And, and the government would disagree with this in large part. So it's not so much for Britain, but it is an example also for the states as they formulate their own declarations of independence. There had to be 13 declarations of independence because there are 13 states declaring independence. It didn't matter that just some delegates signed in Philadelphia onto this. The states would have to approve unless 
those delegates were given the specific power to do that, like Virginia's were when Virginia kind of led the way in this. Now, as an example where the states and their governments could and their appointed leadership or whoever could gather from the example of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and formulate their own using some similar language, but also to explain to the world, to explain to other nations. The, the Americans knew that they were going to have to invite other nations like France into the fray. And in doing that, they wanted to make it known that this was not a rash action. This was not a random decision. This was not something that was not arrived at uh, without struggle. And this was not a, something that was just done flippantly. This was a declaration of separation from this government willing to take on the risks that that would come with. And so it offers this to others, hoping that other governments and people would see this and be in sympathy with the Americans, which many were, right? France eventually does enter the war on the side of the Americans, hoping for an alliance, which they eventually do have following the war as well, but uh, also because the French uh, are long-standing enemies during this time of the British. And also for the future, to this day, over 200 years later, the Declaration of Independence is still discussed as one of the greatest pieces of political philosophy ever written, systematizing these ideas. And it, whether people agree with it or disagree with it, like Jefferson, don't like Jefferson, the place of the Declaration of Independence and the importance of the Declaration of Independence cannot be underestimated. And so what is it in the Declaration of Independence that makes it unique because what was expected of Jefferson and the others who helped edit these things, the, there it went through a couple of drafts and versions actually, but what was expected was a simple listing of the declaration of here is why we are declaring independence from Britain in particular. And the declaration of independence does that later on. However, what Thomas Jefferson did is he, large, uh, he broadened out the question. He enlarged the question and talked about not just the situation between the American colonies and Britain, but he broadened it out to talk about all of political philosophy, talking about the principles of rights, the natural law, what it means to have a right, what, what human rights actually are and entail. And so he formulates this, probably the most famous uh, part of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, a few things we want to point out here. He points out the truths that he's going to mention, which he mentions in this statement as well and continues. He says that the truths that he is going to talk about, he and others agree that they are what are called self-evident truths self-evident truths. Now, I often ask when talking about this with people in a classroom setting, what do you, can you think of an example of a self-evident truth, something that is true by definition, that by its existence, it gives its own evidence to show that it's true. Okay. Now, what self-evident also means is that the statement is so true in and of itself, it does not have to borrow evidence from outside sources in order to prove it. 
And somebody even said that the earth is round. Now that is a truth. There are some people who debate that, but there is a, a truth, but that is not a self-evident truth. That is a truth that is arrived at by study and evidence and observation. It's not self-evident. Earths don't have to necessarily be round. It's a truth that is arrived at by other means. But a self-evident truth is a truth that cannot be untrue because it's true by definition. It's something like um, the statement, All this is used in logic sometimes, all bachelors are unmarried men. And so an unmarried man is a bachelor. So you, you, that's true by definition. Or uh, a student in eighth grade one year came up with a good one, uh, another logical truth that the parts are smaller individually than the whole. That the parts of something that you put together, that the whole is larger than those parts. By definition, think about it. If you cut a, um, like imagine a circle, a pie chart, if you take out a part, it is by definition smaller than the whole thing. Okay, so self-evident truth. One uh, student said that the brain named itself. Okay, now I don't know necessarily that that's, I think it's, it's close. It's uh, one that we'd have to do some more thinking about. But this is one of those things that's interesting to consider that our brain's thinking, does that necessarily produce, if it's just a physical and chemical reaction, just like a Mountain Dew fizzing, does that mean that it produces the foundation for human rights as we understand them? And so Jefferson argues that these things are self Evident. Now, self-evident could be also the, the law of logic, the first law of logic, the law of non-contradiction, which means that you have to use that truth in order to even argue against that truth. You, we cannot escape that. It's like using reason uh, to talk about reason. You can't prove it empirically. It's, it's a, you'll, you'll run into a circle. but uh, And it can be a vicious, vicious circle, meaning it's a uh, flaw in reasoning. But instead, it's, uh, it becomes something that is self-evident. Now, we hold these truths, Jefferson writes, to be self-evident. What are the truths? Number one, that all men are created equal. Number two, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And then subsection, what are the rights? Now, here is Jefferson's argument. Human beings have are created. Now, Jefferson is very evidently not a Christian, though he did have value of Christianity and the, the t moral teachings of Jesus, but he did not believe Jesus rose from the dead. He did not believe that Jesus died for sins. He believed Jesus was a moral teacher and believed in the great value of Christianity in, in the Bible and Western tradition. But he also believed in a God who is the creator, but was not involved in history, which is a fundamental belief of, of Christianity. So Jefferson is not a Christian, but he does believe in uh, that all men are created equal. Now, some people say, well, Jefferson didn't believe women were equal and those type of things. And the society at the time uh, yes, there would be those things that would bear that out. However, Jefferson is talking in the broadest terminology possible, uh, referring to, to mankind. He's referring to humankind. He's saying in his argument, doesn't mean he's totally consistent in application or that the time period will match the principle. What he's meaning is he believes this to be the case. Now, does that mean he's going to apply it? Consistently, no, but he believes that all people are created equal. Now, equal, that's an important word it's, uh, discussed all the time. We have to talk about at some level, what does this mean? Do we, we mean equality of 
value of rights as a human, of a certain human dignity that affords you a certain treatment just because you're human. Doesn't matter what race, religion, sex you are, it doesn't matter that you are afforded a certain expectation of treatment because you're human. You and Jefferson will fall along. There's another version of equality, and there's probably different facets of this, but they're kind of two. Okay, that's one is equal in the sense of that, as Jefferson says, that we're all human beings, and therefore that demands a certain treatment, and he'll go on to follow that up of what that entails. Or there's an equality that recognizes and tries to account for all the differences that have been created in history, society, law, all these type of things, and tries to hand over power to an entity, whether a government or something else, in order to try to treat people unequally, in order to try to get them to the same fair standard or starting point. And now that's, I'm simplifying things, but that's one of the aspects of, of this other view of equality, that there are people who, for whatever reasons, some may be their fault, some may not be, but they, you know, there's differences between people. We know that. We know that to be the case. We know that people not only choose different things, but also in some cases have thing unfair differences that are forced upon them that they have to deal with, right? And so there's a view of equality, which some call equity, um, which is trying to, instead of saying, okay, one standard, no matter what the situation, we apply a standard consistently. And, and in that way, we are all equal before the standard of impartiality imperfectly. Okay? The other standard of equality is that there cannot be one standard because all human beings are different. Therefore, we must account for all the facets of the, those differences and give over power into a, an entity who can try to put all those differences together and add them up and determine how to treat people based on those differences in order that at the end goal, hopefully we're all equal. That is the, the other view. Now, one of the things Jefferson took the first view, not the second. Okay, and people may hold different views. However, there is something to be said. There is something to think about here that knowing that people are unequal in money and age in experience in treatment of historical differences of socioeconomic, all kinds of differences that they may have, things that they may choose, things that they may not choose aspects, you know, diff all kinds of things that people are unequal. And sometimes they choose inequality. And in, in some cases, I chose to be a teacher, I could pro may have uh, chosen something that may have been higher paying, but chose this, well, that was my choice. Now, some people uh, didn't have the opportunities I had didn't have the choice I had. Okay, so there, we're unequal. You know, I had parents who cared for me and loved me and uh, raised me and took care of me. And so, and, and a lot of people didn't have that. And it wasn't their fault. They were just born into the situation. Now, if we think, push that uh, view of equality, continue pushing it forward, what it eventually comes down to is you cycle back around to the first view of equality and you come to what Jefferson's view actually is. Because the further you push this view of equality, that there are differences because of all sorts of things, chosen and unchosen, and there's all manner of things that make people unequal, 
what you eventually get down to is every single individual is different and unequal in some manner. Now, some of those are more harmful than others, and we acknowledge that fully. But down, we're down to the smallest minority possible, and we are down to the individual. And now the what Jefferson believed was we treat all individuals with the same standard. Now, do you believe that consistently? No. Did he follow that consistently? No. But he introduces or he continues a, a pattern of thought that introduces this idea that human beings, according to Jefferson, created by God, created by a creator, by virtue of their humanity, are created equal. And by that very fact, that now creates some demands on other people and on people in government, on people in power. 